Good morning. This is uh, Dr. David Soselsky. I'm a historian and independent scholar who focuses on the history of the, uh, particularly of Eastern North Carolina, where I grew up. Today, I'm, I'm honored to be here uh, welcoming uh, three extraordinary individuals who have written uh, articles for uh, the North Carolina Historical Review. Their articles appeared in the January 2020 uh, edition of the Historical Review and their pioneering works on the history of the African-American struggle in Eastern North Carolina. They're part of the uh, Flyleaf virtual Q&A series that the North Carolina Historical Review is, is doing on um, uh, Facebook. And today I would like to, to uh, welcome uh, Ms. Anna Jones, uh, Professor Jerry Gershenhorn, and uh, Mr. Maury York to the show. Uh, all three of these individuals are people who I have admired for some time. Uh, uh, Ms. Jones, uh, even before the article we're going to talk today, uh, which is called The Long Black Freedom Struggle in Northampton County, North Carolina, 1930s to 1970s, and which was co-authored by, by, by uh, Professor Gershenhorn. Even before that article, I was a fan of uh, her uh, moving, beautiful and informative documentary, Chairman Jones, An Improbable Leader, uh, which came out in 2015. Uh, it aired in a uh, shortened version, uh, a, a streamlined version, I'll say, uh, on UNC TV. And that version can still be found at any time at folkstream.net. Uh, Jerry Gershenhorn, who I welcome uh, today. Uh, I, I, I followed uh, the professor's work for many, many years. Uh, he's a distinguished professor at North Carolina Central University. And I just have to say, I'm a special fan of uh, his book, Lewis Austin and the Carolina Times, uh, which focuses both on an extraordinary but relatively unknown African-American leader in North Carolina, but also uses Lewis Austin's life to tell a much broader story that sweeps across the expanse of 20th century North Carolina history. And finally, we have Maura York, uh, uh, who is one of the most knowledgeable authorities on the history of Eastern North Carolina today. I've known Maury since his days uh, providing leadership at the North Carolina Collection at Joyner Library at East Carolina University. Uh, he's probably um, been the uh, 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 informed so much of my work over the years, I couldn't be begin to know where to start. And, um, uh, and then I've also followed him and, and participated in activities when he was the director at the Tar River Center for History and Culture at Lewisburg College. With that out of the way, I noticed that Sheila Barrick uh, uh, Colonel is, is back with us. Uh, <laughs> would you like to step in now and... and Well, Dr. Soselski, thank you for taking the wheel. I got Zoomed. <laughs> I understand, I was, it happens. I was it a casualty happens to of Zoom, so. Uh, thank you for introducing everyone and thank you to our audience for viewing. If you have any questions during the conversation, please feel free to type them in the chat and they will be answered and sit back and enjoy. Uh, I'm very sorry, uh, my feed totally dropped. And so I'm so glad that you picked it up and thank you. And, no worry. Uh, and um, enjoy. Thank you so much. I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye -bye. Um, I also want to say what a privilege it is to be here uh, uh, as, as part of an event 
connected to the North Carolina Historical Review. Um, this January 2020 issue edition of the review that the articles we're discussing today is part of uh, is really a, a, a good example of the powerful and important scholarship that the North Carolina Historical Review does year in and year out. And um, uh, the, the two articles we're discussing today, plus another one in the same uh, edition of the Historical Review by Ben Justison on Henry Cheatham, a Reconstruction African-American leader, really made this particular issue uh, to me one of the, the classics of the North Carolina Historical Review, which is now something like a century old. Um, welcome, uh, Anna, Maury, and Jerry. How are you all? Doing great. Hey, yeah. Good to be with you. We'll get to the questions in, in just a second. Um, I want to start, though, just by reading um, a couple of brief passages from, from both of your articles. And uh, uh, I want to start with uh, Anna and Jerry's article, which again is called The Long Black Freedom Struggle in Northampton County, North Carolina, 1930s to 1970s. And in that article, they write, African Americans in Northampton County in Northeastern North Carolina engaged in a decades long struggle for voting rights, quality public education and economic opportunity. This article discusses rural African Americans organizing efforts which began during the Great Depression, picked up steam during and after World War II and bore fruit with important gains in education and politics during the 1960s and 70s. In one of the poorest counties in the country, facing an, an entrenched system of white supremacy, with most African-Americans working as tenant farmers or sharecroppers, blacks who were independent of the white controlled economy took on leadership roles in the freedom struggle. Black clergy, farmers, funeral, funeral home directors, doctors, attorneys, and returning veterans played critical roles in increasing black political power, challenging unequal publication and fighting for economic opportunity. And then I'd like to read a, sh a similar short passage from Maury's article, which is called A State of Shock the desegregation of the public schools of Franklin County, North Carolina, 1965 to 1968. And Maury wrote, the premise that North Carolina's black and white schools were equal was an illusion. Although the state increased per capita funding for black schools after 1940 and a statewide 50 million bond referendum for school construction had been approved by voters in 1949. Most black schools, their buildings, laboratories, and recreational facilities were inferior to those for whites. Grounds were less spacious and classrooms more crowded. White students generally benefited from better supervision, teachers with lighter teaching loads and a broad array of extracurricular activities. The Supreme Court unanimous, unanimously acknowledged this disparity in its Brown decision announced on May 17, 1954. The court concluded, quote, that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. I think many of the people listening today might be a little surprised to hear about two African-American freedom struggles, A, that they've never heard of, and B, that came, that occurred in Eastern North Carolina. I think that most people still look at the history of America's 
civil rights movement and, and particularly here in North Carolina, you think of Greensboro, you think of Alabama or Mississippi, um, not rural Eastern North Carolina. Can each of you for a second talk about why black activists in Northampton and Franklin counties faced such an oppressive version of white supremacy in many ways worse than in the state's Piedmont? And can you tell me a little bit about how black citizens in both places organized against racial injustice? And um, Jerry, if you would start, that, that would be nice. Okay, uh, thank you, David. And thanks, thanks to Ann Miller and to Sheila Carroll for organizing this event. I really appreciate it. But yeah, uh, African-Americans, as, as you uh, noted in that uh, brief paragraph you read, faced an incredibly entrenched system of uh, white supremacy, racial segregation. Mm -hmm. um, as you heard from Maury's uh, paragraph, uh, just like in Franklin County, funding uh, of black schools was, was pitiful, really, compared to that of white schools. Uh, Northampton had a black majority and, and still has a black majority in terms of its population. And those areas with black majorities, in, including in other Southern states, uh, tended to be those areas where whites were particularly uh, focused on suppressing African-American, any type of African-American organizing. Uh, John Salter, who was an organizer, an activist in Mississippi during the civil rights movement, engaged in sit-ins in, in Jackson, Mississippi. When he came to Eastern North Carolina to organize in the 1960s, he said that Eastern North Carolina was as bad as Mississippi with regard to, you know, uh, white intimidation and suppression of African Americans. Um, as, as you noted, Northampton was one of the poorest states, poorest counties in the country. Um, but African Americans weren't stopped. I mean, they organized for voting rights starting in the 1930s. Uh, they worked with the NAACP by 1944 in the midst of World War II. Uh, the Northampton uh, County and uh, Halifax County, they had a joint NAACP chapter. That was the most, uh, the second most, uh, had the second largest number of members in the entire state next to Raleigh. And this is a much more rural and lower population area. And it was very dangerous to join the NAACP. Mm -hmm. So they, they organized the NAACP. Uh, in the 1950s, an uh, attorney named James R. Walker Jr., who had helped to desegregate the University of North Carolina Law School as a student in the 1950s, mm -hmm. he came and became the first black lawyer in the six county area. And he organized, wow. helped organize for voting rights. So it was a long struggle. Uh, and mm -hmm. as, as we noted, it took a long time, but it did bore, bear some fruit uh, after decades of struggle. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna, Ms. Jones. Yes. How uh, uh, did you respond to that question about why, why things were so, both why, why they were so hard in Northampton County and how the African American community overcame those hardships? I, I think that in Northampton County, um, it was more oppressive because the slavery and plantation culture persisted there even into mm -hmm. the 1980s, you know, and I mm -hmm. call it North Carolina's ap apartheid. Jim Crow was North yeah. Carolina's apartheid. Sure. So it, was, it was economically self-serving and necessary for whites to cement control of blacks in Northampton County because they were all sharecroppers. They were all uh, uh, tenant farmers. And so whites could not exist. They could not maintain their uh, uh, living standards or anything without blacks. And so it was necessary to control them. So, you know, with Blacks making up about 70% of the population and farming being about 90% of the uh, economic uh, engine in Northampton County, it was necessary. And so they had to keep them down. Um, uh, they had to keep Black people in fear. So there was fear of losing a livelihood because the white landowner could determine sure. the school children went to school or they just controlled your life. And in Northampton, uh, there was no uh, uh, 
reason to worry about sitting in in the front of the bus or anything because there were no buses. <laughs> so, so the struggle, you know, so the difference in you know what was happening in the Piedmont and in, in, in the rural areas. So in North right. Hampton, the struggle was for education. That mm. was the big push. And uh, mm. in order to uh, have better education, you needed to have um, better resources. You needed to have people on the school boards and in various uh, other offices, elected offices in the, in the county. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, black citizens began to organize and they organized in the churches. Uh, the NAACP was a big um, uh, uh, proponent of that. Mm -hmm. So you had all of these people in, in churches who were also masons and uh, 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 business people and NAACP uh, members, they were all working together to make things happen. They had to do it uh, in secret. Sure. So the churches were the only free spaces where black people could uh, assemble and make plans. Wow. So that's how they organized. And I think that the reason that it was so oppressive was because it was so necessary to keep blacks in their, in their position. And Nat Turner's rebellion had taken place not too far from there. Yes. And that's another uh, contributing yeah. factor. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I know that you're a scholar and a documentary filmmaker when it comes to this story. And I don't want to get uh, jump the gun, but, but you do, your family does have a personal connection to this story as well. Yes. 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 My family does have a personal connection because my father was um, one of the leaders in the organizing efforts in Northampton County, especially beginning in the, in the 50s and up through the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. Uh, go ahead. Well, I, I mentioned it in, in the introduction, but um, for those who are just uh, 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 beginning to listen now, I, I, I do strongly want to encourage you to, to, to uh, find Ms. Jones's documentary called Chairman Jones, An Improbable Leader, which discusses some of that background and, 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 your, and your father. It's, it's a, a moving and inspiring uh, film and I, I, I can't thank you enough for making it. Thank you. Uh, Maury, what about, um, uh, what about in Franklin County? How would how would you respond to the? I I would I was. I thought I was fairly inert as a historian that focuses on Eastern North Carolina, to violent to white violence and intimidation, <laughs> um, but uh, of African American, of the African American freedom struggle, but your article was astonishing, in the ways that it described uh, white efforts to hold on to power and white supremacy. Can you talk about that in the way that African-Americans overcame uh, uh, that kind of resistance? Well, uh, going back to the initial question, David, the, I think this um, situation stemmed from the poverty and lack of education in Franklin County. Um, many blacks or most blacks in Franklin County lived below the poverty level and were generally less well, well educated than whites. I think the educational level of adults um, in Franklin County was about eighth grade for whites and maybe sixth grade for blacks. Um, and tenant farmers and sharecroppers and people who rented in towns uh, were not fully free to uh, pursue their rights. Mm -hmm. they, they were subject to intimidation by their landlords. And so um, this, uh, this held back African-Americans in, in pursuing their um, civil rights. It was certainly the case in, in the school desegregation efforts. Um, property owners, on the other hand, uh, among the African Americans, um, felt free to pursue their civil rights. Um, 
religious leaders uh, were in the vanguard of efforts to de desegregate the public schools of Franklin County. Uh, people like Sidney Garfield Dunstan and early Linwood Brody, uh, two black uh, Baptist ministers, uh, were leaders in the effort to promote uh, desegregation of the public schools. Um, they um, sponsored petition drives and wrote letters and tried to convince the Board of Education to implement the Brown decision in the early 1960s. Um, and um, Dunstan and his wife, for example, led a um, uh, protest of the conditions of several of the black schools in Franklin County. Um, Luther Coppage, another black mm -hmm. uh, Baptist minister, was active in the NAACP. And um, it was he and others who banded together in 1965 with the help of, um, of uh, Eva Clayton of Warren County, who connected them with Julius Chambers, a civil rights um, attorney in Charlotte, who uh, brought the Coppage versus Franklin County Board of Education case that resulted in the desegregation of the local schools. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Uh, One of the things that struck me about all, uh, about bo both of these articles was uh, the extent of African-American organizing and resistance to that oppression, but also how many different people you all, I don't know how you, not, not, None of you focus, neither article focuses like on like the one hero person, you know, there's, there's people in every corner of life, uh, school teachers, sharecroppers, uh, uh, ministers, housewives who are playing, you know, showing remarkable courage and, you know, are sort of these unsung heroes that we've never heard of. And I was hoping to, that each of you might mention maybe at least one person that as you did this research and as you told the story, one uh, who sort of stand out to you, uh, uh, someone that maybe we probably have not heard of um, and maybe just a little bit about them, about you know, sort of what, why, they, why you came away admiring them. Um, and Anna, would you, would you mind starting? Well, okay. Um, of course, I, I walk away uh, admiring my own father. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> do, uh, do tell, do tell. <laughs> his name was James H. Jones. And uh, he was born 1916 on a former slave plantation in Northampton County. Uh, didn't have an opportunity for education himself. Mourned the loss of education his entire life was determined that his eight children were going to have education and that people in the county were going to have the opportunity for uh, education. So it was a long struggle for them from the 50s up to uh, the 60s to, um, uh, he, he was a person who had the vision. I asked the question during some of my interviews, why was it that you all chose him to be the chairman of the Board of Education or to, to serve on the Board of Education. They said, well, he- And what they say? Education was his thing. He said, everybody knew that he was the one uh, who was pushing for education. He had the vision. The rest of us were pretty complacent. That's how things were, but not him. He saw something different. Mm -hmm. And so they began to organize in the churches. You see that, the, uh, as I had mentioned before, the churches, the deacons in the churches, the masons, uh, mm. the businessmen, all of these people, they're all the same people in these organizations, okay? So your teachers and your principals and, 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 and everybody were all working together and you organize uh, in the churches, organize in the PTA. In Northampton County, my father became the president of the Squire Elementary School PTA in 1957. Wow. It provided a forum for him to to be active, to, 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 for, for activism. 
That's fascinating. Yeah, so you've got this uh, a constituency now of black people. Mm -hmm. And in Northampton mm -hmm. County, there was a citywide, I mean, a countywide black PTA. So PTA business, church business, all of this business, it was all about organizing for, um, for success and for, for progress in the future. So you had um, Masonic people in the Masonic lodges who were making sure that children went to school so that there would be enough resources. So that, because mm -hmm. apparently if you don't have enough children going to school, you can't get certain resources or what have you. Yes, yes. And yes. at that PTA, he, uh, they actually had to pay for their own resources. So they paid dues, they paid, I saw the minute books. They paid 25 cents a month for their dues. Wow. So that they could buy books and, and plant shrubbery and provide lighting and water fountains and things because the county mm -hmm. had just built a building for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, consolidating some of the two room schools. Mm -hmm. It's a build, build a building, they had no cafeteria, they had nothing. That's a fascinating story. It's also like a good example, you know, like a world in a grain of sand kind of story about how people could take something fairly ordinary like a PTA or the Masons and in a system, you know, the, a world that's trying to oppress you, use it as that you can use anything, that you, right. you know, in, in, in a way that you, in, in any group, any space can be a way to organize and improve things. That's right. I think it's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. I know we need to move on, but I just want to ask you to, to give us one sense of the flavor of your father's character, not as a public figure, but it's the sort of the kind of man he was um, that only, only hit, you know, the, that you would see from sort of inside the family, just to make, make him human for us. Okay, he was a quiet person. He didn't have a lot to say. Uh, read the Bible, read uh, Sunday school lessons. We had to you know, re re recite sun, um, Bible verses before we could eat and that sort of thing. He was, uh, he was an encourager. He would always say, uh, if you wanted to do something, try something. He said, try it, try it and see how it works. As long as it's not something that's gonna hurt uh, anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a giver. He was a farmer, of course. And so he planted these large gardens so that he could feed the mm. community. Nice. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was, um, he, was a, he was a teacher. He was always teaching. He was the superintendent of the Sunday school. Mm. Um, yes. And so he was always uh, trying to um, buy b a bus or uh, add some classrooms to the church so that the children mm -hmm. could have an opportunity um, for, for, for more, um, uh, more, more activities. Uh, as a father, um, he was very strict. He didn't take any stuff and you had to kind of walk a tightrope, but he was a person- Old, old school. Yeah, yeah, very old school. He was a person of, uh, of integrity. If he told you he was gonna do something, you could take that to the bank. Uh, if he told you he was going, he would think about it, he'd think about it, he'd get back to you. And so he was, um, he had uh, great leadership characteristics from the time he was a boy. You could see that, uh, you know, from how the other people talked about him and in his position in his family, he had to take the lead in his family because his mother had passed away when he was a boy. His father was elsewhere, you know, doing some other things. Mm -hmm. And so um, he was a person that the family uh, looked up to. There were lots of people in my family and in his family, eight siblings. He had eight siblings. I had seven siblings. You make me feel like I could, uh, like, you know, like, like I know him, you know, I can imagine the kind of man, man he was. Well, yeah, and he would uh, listen. He would listen to the whites. Mm -hmm. He would listen to the blacks. He tried to understand where the white people were coming from. He said, you have to listen to both sides. You have to understand, uh, have to walk in another person's shoes. Then you'll be able to relate to them. And so he conducted a lot of his work through relationships and he was successful through relationships. He was able to um, have relationships with the white farmers. Uh, after he was able to break into the farming network because farmers ran Northampton County. Sure. They were the county commissioners, you know, they were the school board. 
That's a rare gift. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry to go down that trail so long, but, but, I, but he just sounds like such a compelling person that I um, uh, couldn't resist. Okay, no problem. Um, Jerry, was there someone that, that as, as you did this research, as you talked with people as you, uh, who, who really st uh, stood out uh, for you? I mean, there's so many, it's hard to pick one, but I'll just briefly talk yeah. about one. I mean, uh, the voting rights movement in North Carolina is something you know, of great interest to me. And um, as we said before, it's very tough in Northampton County uh, and there were a lot of people involved, but Louise Lassiter, Louise Lassiter in the late 1950s, she organized and became the lead plaintiff, the plaintiff in a case to challenge the literacy test constitutionality, a case that ended up going all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And she had a lot of backing, you know, individuals didn't do stuff alone, as you've mm -hmm. we've noted. We've noted. Uh, James R. Walker Jr., the attorney, was mm -hmm. pivotal, who I mentioned briefly. But Louise Lassiter, she and her husband owned a 25 acre farm. So that made them a little bit independent because they were not working sure. with, uh, white landowners. And uh, she had been denied the right to vote, even though she was literate. Mm -hmm. uh, so the literacy test, as many people probably know, was not carried on fairly. I mean, people were asked, uh, for example, you know, sometimes they would say, well, the, the, the law was you had to be able to read and understand a portion of the state constitution. So one time uh, a registrar would read the entire election law and read it so fast nobody could understand it. And then the person would be required to write down word for word the entire law, which of course was impossible. Sometimes the registrars, and of course the registrars were all white, they were illiterate. And they were ruling on literate people including university professors. I mean, a Hampton University professor, a biology uh, professor, uh, Amanda uh, Peel in 1936 tried to vote, tried to register to vote on the literacy test and she was denied. But anyway, in any event, Louise Lasseter, her case went to the US Supreme Court. It was not successful. The US Supreme Court ruled that uh, the states had the right to uh, have their own rules as long as they weren't discriminatory, which of course they were. But on its face, the literacy test, the law did not mention race the way it was written. Right. So it was obviously discriminatory. And literacy test was, was uh, critical in North Carolina. The poll tax, which was still used in much of the South, had been repealed in 1920. So the poll tax was not an issue. I mean, the big issues were the unfair use of the literacy test mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the fact that it was the whites. And in those days, the white Democrats, it was a one party uh, region. Mm -hmm and white Democrats mm -hmm. who were the party of white supremacy, they controlled the uh, registration process. And it was also difficult because they only opened up registration for a few days a year. You could only <laughs> register for a few days a year. And this was done by the counties. So it was very difficult. But, uh, but Louise Lassiter, you know, she was a champion in trying to challenge that vote. And eventually, of course, the literacy test was overturned in 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. It wasn't, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Jerry, but uh, in a way there was sort of a silver lining even in losing at the Supreme Court because it really helped refocus the civil rights movement to know, you know, the courts are not going to fix it for us. That, right. that, that, that we're going to, we're going to, we're going, we're going to need to campaign for uh, federal legislation, which the movement did do and succeeded in doing. Right, and one of the, the U, there was part of the U.S. Supreme Court decision, even though they denied uh, that the, the uh, literacy test was unconstitutional at that time in 1959. They did say that Congress could legislate on voting rights, so that mm. helped down That's in 1965 sure. when legislation was passed, which was effective. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead. And also in North Carolina. <laughs> Uh, the, the fact that the Louise Lester case went to the Supreme Court, North Carolina did reduce the amount of, of um, authority that the registrars had, mm. in, you know, exactly. in all of the state. Uh -huh. So that was an outcome of it. You know, no, Thank you. I, it, but, but there was, you know, some yeah. fallout from it. Thank you. I had forgotten that, but that was important at the, at the time. Yeah. Um, and of course we, 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 
since we can't tell the whole story here, but you talk about somebody like Louise Lassiter and when you read your article or you read Maury's article, you know that it's not just the courage it took. You know, you, your articles are full of instances of African-American activists being targeted in every which way they can be with all kinds of violence and cross burnings and uh, uh, shooting into their homes and everything else that can happen, that can, that can happen, that can happen. And um, so- Yeah, I mean, it's important uh, to note that although people often think North Carolina was some great progressive state, it was not so progressive in many ways. And so it's important to understand that. And, you know, it makes it obviously when that racism and that racist mentality is so entrenched, it's that much harder to fight against it and to defeat it. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, Maury, you mentioned uh, quite a number of, of African-American activists uh, earlier uh, in, in Franklin County that, that, that played a role in uh, accomplishing school desegregation. Is, is there one in particular that, that from your research that, that stands out uh, that you'd like to talk about? Well, I think the person I admired the most was uh, Christine Coppedge, the wife of the Reverend Luther Coppedge. Her son, Harold, was the lead plaintiff in the Coppedge versus Franklin County Board of Education case. Um, in 1965, the Franklin County Board of Education was required to <clears throat> develop a compliance plan um, as a result of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, all all um, school systems had to come up with a plan for how they would desegregate their schools in order to be eligible for um, federal funding, for example, the elementary mm -hmm. um, <laughs> schools. And Education Act. And um, in, in Franklin County, the local radio station and the um, newspaper, the Franklin Times, published the names mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. children and the families who took advantage of the compliance plan and applied for um, transfers to formerly all white schools. They published them on the air and in, in print. And as a result of this um, uh, act, um, these African American families were subjected to all sorts of uh, horrendous intimidation and violence. Coppages uh, were particularly uh, singled out since. Um, Harold Coppage's name was um, in the lawsuit and um, that was later brought. And um, they, um, a cross was burned in their yard, fire bombs were set off, tacks were put in their uh, driveway. Um, and Mrs. Coppage um, was a very strong woman and she had to be because her husband, Luther, was currently enrolled um, at Shaw University Raleigh uh, studying um, to, to be a minister. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. she sometimes faced this uh, harassment and intimidation and violence alone. Uh, this included things like people shooting um, guns into their home. And uh, she, she was an extraordinarily um, brave woman and um, had the privilege of meeting her um, at, when I was doing research for this article. Thank you very much. Um, we're in the, starting the last quarter of our, of our uh, show now, and um, uh, maybe I'll get back to some more specific historical questions, but um, I wanna skip ahead a little bit and um, ask you all sort of the big picture questions. I mean, th these days I have never seen so much interest in um, really because of the Black Lives Matter movement in our African-American past and the history of white supremacy uh, in the United States and how it has shaped the present. Um, so I wanna ask you a two part question. And the, the first part, I guess is more historical. Um, 
looking back on all that you've learned, you, these two articles are phenomenal sagas of African-American struggle that, that span certainly the, tw the whole 20th century uh, with respect to your article, Anna and, and Jerry, and um, the, a pivotal moment of the 20th century with you, Maury. Um, uh, we're all really just learning this history for the first time. I, I remember uh, the two, two leading Southern political scientists, Walter DeVries and Jack Bass, writing that, that the civil rights movement had bypassed Eastern North Carolina. <laughs> you know, and you're right, and a smiling, like, like you can't, it's so detached from reality that you can't, uh, but that's kind of what we were taught. I grew up in Eastern North Carolina. And um, uh, so um, first off, I do wanna draw everyone, anyone that can, find these articles, they're rich and they're debt complex and the stories are rich and complex, um, dig into them. But Anna, Jerry and more, I wanna ask you, what to you from, from all the research you've done, what was, what was the, what's most important uh, to us? What's the most important thing that you learned about the civil rights movement? And then I'm gonna ask, what's the most important thing that, that you learned that, for us today? So Anna, do you mind starting with what was, what, what, what was most important in, in, in what you learned about uh, Northampton County and, and how it shaped your idea of how the civil rights movement happened? I think that the most important thing that I learned about civil rights movement in Northampton was how quietly the civil rights movement evolved in Northampton County. Do tell. Under, under, uh, uh, under, under, under the, under the, under the veil. Uh, for instance, uh, in Northampton, this uh, secret group of black men. Mm -hmm. called The Ten. Mm -hmm. Matt, show the um, uh, family portrait so I can point out my father in there. Uh, the Ten. Uh, other people didn't know anything about The Ten. They were secret. But they were men from the churches. They were men from the Masonic halls. They were men, businessmen and all, who got together <laughs> and made a decision that they were going to fight for rights, okay? They um, met at midnight so they wouldn't be detected uh, by whites who meant no harm. And then they trusted a white man to come into their midst. Uh, lawyer, um, Judge Perry Martin, who was a lawyer at the time, he came into their midst. They were working to try to get some uh, black person on the school board. Mm -hmm. But it couldn't happen. My father ran a couple of times, but he couldn't get elected, even though the majority of the population is black. So Mr. Martin came mm -hmm. in and said, if you all help me get to the state legislature, then when I get there, I'll change the number of um, school board members from five to seven. And I named James Jones to one of those slots and, 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 uh, and name a white woman to the others. So from the 50s up until the 70s, there was this um, movement of people uh, from segregation to cooperation. There were these alliances with liberal whites in Northampton mm -hmm. that no one knew anything about. So mm -hmm. my point was how quietly that happened and how effective they were. And then this guy, Perry Martin, was a, an interesting character on his own because mm -hmm. he had to represent the whites. They refused to follow Brown versus Board. And right. He took the case to court. He didn't win, he knew it wasn't gonna win. And so everybody was saying, well, you know, whose side is this guy on? You know, well, he's a lawyer, he's a politician and he's doing what he needs to do. He knew they had to follow the law. And so I guess the, the bottom line to all of this is there was nobody marching in the streets. There's nobody throwing things through windows 
You know, nobody is sitting down on buses or anything, no riots, anything like that. They just did what they needed to do quietly. They were organizing and, and, and making decisions at the edges of the fields, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mm-hmm. in, in, at the service station, mm-hmm. just like that. And then there was one a white conservative Republican and my father was a black liberal Democrat. <laughs> they were farmers, they worked together. He, Mr. Grant, could con- control the radical whites, and my father could influence the radical black. They worked together to get things done in Northampton County. So that was probably one of the most outstanding things to me that happened was that it was quiet and more peaceful. And in very, and they, very thoughtful and wise. In a, yeah. I mean, like, like yeah. this, they're not just letting this happen. I mean, right. Well, thank you, and, and we'll have one more question for you, but let's move on to, uh, Maury, do, do uh, uh, what do you feel was the most important thing that, that, that you learned about the civil rights movement uh, in Franklin County? Well, I'm, I'm gonna flip that just a little bit and, and talk a little bit about Please, yeah. context. Um, yeah. One of the things that really surprised me is the um, pervasiveness and uh, impact of the Ku Klux Klan uh, at that time. Um, There were probably 700 to 2000 members of the Klan in Franklin County in the mid 1960s. They had four claverns and an organization called the Franklin County Improvement Association. Uh, People who were running for office, including um, of course, there were all whites running for office in the mid 1960s. Uh, they would go to this Franklin County Improvement Association, which would have a meet and greet and handshaking event, and and they would go there um, in order to uh, garner votes from members of the KKK because they knew it was such a a, a large group of people. Um, when a when the Klan put up one of their members to run against um, the vice chairman of the Franklin County Board of Education, Clint Fuller, in 1966, um, he came within just a few votes of, of winning that race, um, mm-hmm. which was just astounding to me that somebody who had overt Klan support uh, would, would come that close to winning um, a countywide race. So um, you had a situation that was um, very intimidating to uh, blacks, but but despite that, uh, people like the Coppages and um, others who joined in this uh, lawsuit, Coppage versus Franklin County Board of Education in 1965, worked quietly and diligently with the capable help of the NAACP and um, uh, their attorney, Julius Chambers to uh, achieve their goal. Excellent, thank you. Jerry, what about you? You, you, um, The article covers such an array of, and and such an uh, sort of enduring uh, legacy of of activism. What do you think that you took away from it as as the, 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 the most important as 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 we think of as it as we think about the history of the civil rights movement. I mean, one of one of the things I took away from it, and kind of maybe I wasn't totally surprised because, in some ways, it is similar to other areas. That you know, when people use the term civil rights movement. And I know a lot of people use the term black freedom struggle. And I think the latter is more appropriate for mm-hmm. several reasons, but one that it was such a struggle that, you, that people had to struggle against entrenched inequality, discrimination, racist oppression, politically, with regard to education, with regard to economics. And we talked in the article only a little bit about economics. Yes. And sometimes it's partly a function of Getting information, uh, but I was there was a, a you know an effort uh, that uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, organized with local people in Northampton County and in the region 
-hmm. in order to improve and break down segregation in, in manufacturing. There was a manufacturing plant called Miles Craft, a textile mill in Northampton that had been segregated. They actually, and one of the reasons mm -hmm. it was actually uh, segregated was, you know, segregation in some cases was a victory over exclusion because when the plant right. was first built in the 1950s, they only hired whites. Right. And Reverend uh, P.A. Bishop and another gentleman went up to New York, I believe it was, to meet with the parent company, L.V. Miles, and say, we've got a lot of African-American workers who could produce a lot of, uh, you know, textiles in this mill if you opened it up to them. And they actually did. So they built another uh, section of the factory and put a, a huge wall down the middle. So black workers on one and white workers on the other. And then SNCC came in in the 60s. And this was after the 64 Civil Rights Act, which banned you know, racial segregation and banned employment discrimination. And they, you know, they worked with local people to challenge this uh, you know, segregation. Mm -hmm. And they you know, ultimately got some victories. But I'll tell you, economically, it's really tough. I mean, right now sure. in North Washington County, you have a, uh, I think the entire uh, board of commissioners are all African-American. The chair is African-American. The county manager is African-American. But Northampton is still a poor county. Right. And not I'm not saying it's the fault of the politicians. You have to organize at every level. Right. So, you know, you know, people say, well, politics is local. Well, politics is local. It's, it's, it's yeah. regional, statewide, it's right. national. And right. so- these, Jerry, for, for, uh, on, on that note, um, let me move to the last question and start it with you. Is, is um, when you look at, 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 at this story, do you see uh, relevance or lessons for, for the current moment, that, the current historic moment that we're in? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, many, but I mean, the- you maybe, have... maybe, give me, maybe give me one especially good one. <laughs> Well, I don't, you know, this, I don't know if this is a lesson, but I mean, one thing that struck me in terms of the, the, the research we did uh, in, uh, in 1947, there was an attempted lynching of a man named uh, 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 blanking on his name, Buddy. Buddy Godkin. Wasn't it Buddy God, Godwin? Buddy Bush. God, God, God Buddy was Bush. his given name. Uh, Buddy Bush, and he, you know, he miraculously and heroically escaped from the lynchers. Well, at the time, the police chief was a man named Frank Outland, and Outland, Outland was uh, said at the time that there were good pe the the lynch mob. He called the lynch mob good people. <laughs> you know, I don't know if you remember uh, the former president said uh, in the uh, you know the uh, the racist protest in Charlottesville, there were good people on both sides. Well, that same man, Frank Outland, was the sheriff of Northampton County in the 1960s. And he, would, he was reputed to be a member of the Ku Klux Klan. So you have, you know, people who are supposed to be enforcing the law, and they were doing just the opposite. On January 6th, you had, you know, some of the people who went down to January 6th, some of the insurrectionists who went and stormed the Capitol, they were former members of the military, some of them apparently were police. Now, I'm not talking about the police who were defending the Capitol, but police, off-duty police who were insurrectionists. So in other words, to, you know, to challenge you know, racist oppression and white supremacy and systemic racism, you know, it, it takes tremendous struggle back then and still today. And unfortunately, some of the problems are, that we had back then are still with us. Thank you. Uh, Mari, uh, do, do, what, what about you? Do you, do you, do you see a, a relevance today in, in these stories? I absolutely do, David. Um, to me, one of the, the significant aspects of the case in Franklin County is what fear can do to people. Uh, mm. Fear of losing white privilege uh, or status can lead people to um, either exercise poor judgment or worse, exercise uh, violence and, and engage in violent activity. And I think uh, what we saw on January 6th at the US Capitol um, 
ties in with that concept. Those people, um, I think, um, are afraid of losing um, uh, status or, or control or their economic stability, and um, and and therefore many of them engaged in violent acts. And I think there's a parallel here. Thank you. And I'm afraid we've lost uh, uh, Anna Jones's feed. I, I can't ask her that question. I'd, I'd love to know how she, um, what she would say. Um, hello? Hello, can you hear are you, me? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. You can't see me, right? I can't see you, but I can hear your voice, which, okay. which I, it, I'll, I'll live with if I, if I can't see you. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, uh, wait a minute. I see. Oh, okay. There I there am. There you are. Okay. Um, the question: Do I see parallels? Do you see relevance in Rele this or in this past for today? Yes, I do. And for me, it comes down to responsible leadership. Mm -hmm. um, that we should be able to. Um, the, that cooperation is possible across ideologies, across political lines, across ethnic lines and all of that. But we've got to have the right leadership, people who would listen to the other side. And um, if we could have a Marshall Grant, who was a conservative white Republican, mm -hmm. and a James Jones, who could cooperate in <coughs> County, North Carolina in the 1960s, 70s and beyond, why can't we do that today? We, this is what is needed today. We have to be able to hear each other, talk to each other. You have to have responsible leadership, somebody who's going to say, we need to do what is good for our country. They were doing what was best for their community, regardless of their ideologies. And so the relevance to me today is in that realm, uh, listening and talking to each other, having somebody who's at the, at the top, who's saying, mm -hmm. this is how we need to move. My father was a strategist and a tactician for mm -hmm. uh, the movement. We need that today. I don't see that today. We need somebody to step forward and do that or somebody's to step forward at every mm -hmm. level and do that. So that's how I see the relevance uh, in what we're dealing with today, Black Lives Matter movement and all of that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Um, I think, you know, over this past year, um, uh, I have never seen so much interest in, uh, young people have so much interest in, in, in our past and the role of the kind of scholarship that, that the three of you have done to me is just critical. And I, and I can't thank you enough for all those who hear this, <laughs> I, I, I applaud you. We've been learning, I think both, um, a great deal about the nature of, I don't know, our hardships of white supremacy, of, of the thing um, that, that I think helped us to, uh, to understand the world in which we now struggle. But I think also to you, we're seeing role models and people in our past that we as North Carolinians can be especially proud of people who, who have inspired, who have worked together, who have brought out the best light within themselves and, and then uh, helped to, to, to had a vision of how to share that light as, 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 a, as one community of people. Um, so thank you all. Thank you to the North Carolina Historical Review and the Flyleaf Series for hosting us. Uh, I wish we could talk um, much longer, but um, I'm very grateful to have been able to join join you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, all. Bye. Bye. -bye. Mm -hmm.